I think we have to realize that there is no single Textus Receptus. There are Textus Recepti, multiples of them that even differ with each other. I will give you a list that I have put together of variations between Textus Receptuses and where the King James actually chooses different TRs for different situations. And you can see textual criticism in the King James translation as they were looking at different manuscripts and putting it together. Welcome back to Conversations with a Calvinist. My name is Keith Foskey, and I am a Calvinist. And I am joined today by my good friend, David Martin, who is a who is the voice behind many of the audiobooks that I've been listening to lately, and my new friend, Joshua Barzon, the author of The Forgotten Preface, Surprising Insights on the Translation Philosophy of the King James Translators. Josh and David, thank you both for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, we are here today to have a conversation about your book, Joshua, that you have uh, that you have published on the subject of the King James translation or the King James translators preface, and that is something that I think a lot of people don't even think about when they think about the the question of the King James controversy, the question of the king of things like King James onlyism. And uh, many people know what that is, and that is basically the belief that the King James Bible is not only superior to other translations of the Bible in English, but it is the only Bible that English-speaking people should use. And uh, right. that is sometimes referred to as the King James only movement. Now, um, reading the book and having gone through it, well, I, 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 let me back up. Having listened to the book, having listened to David's David's buttery voice, which I always mention, he has that that wonderful voice. Uh, having voice. listened to it, yes, yes, he does. Uh, having listened to it, uh, I, I I I know that you grew up in a King James only situation. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what the what your situation was growing up? What kind of church it was and and your background. Yeah, I'd be glad to, and thanks again for having me on. And um, my background's kind of interesting because I've had different theological stages of life, um, but up until recently in my adult life, the King James was kind of the thread that held the different denominational and theological views of my family together. So um, my, my mom and dad actually grew up nominal Catholics, um, and then my dad worked with the State Department in the military. We lived over in the Middle East, and it was actually in Saudi Arabia, uh, right off the coast of the Red Sea, when um, he was presented with the gospel at a Bible study on his compound and trusted the gospel, uh, trusted Christ, and was saved. And uh, we were more in kind of a charismatic, um, non-denominational leaning movement at that time. But the King James was definitely held up um, and taught to my dad and, and us as well as you know, not just a version, but the only version, you know, everything else is a perversion to some degree. Um, and then as a teenager, we kind of moved into another theological realm, another denominational realm um, of what is often referred to as IFB um, or Independent Fundamental Baptist. Um, I would say that is where the King James only doctrine started to actually get taught to me. Um, I went to college <clears throat> for ministry um, at a college in Northwest Indiana, um, had a great time there. Um, I still retain a lot of, uh, you know, Baptist beliefs that I was taught there and that I hold to this day. Um, but that's where the doctrines of King James onlyism was even more so solidified in my mind. Um, teachings that, you know, if we don't have every word, you know, individual, we don't have the word of God at all. Um, you know, the modern versions, they're changing doctrines by removing passages and, and parts of verses. And, you know, they're using manuscripts that were found in trash cans in the Sinai Desert. You know, th things like that. <laughs> we laugh, but I mean, I, those words have come out of my mouth to people, um, to, to my shame in my past and in my zeal. Um, there are inner city people I used to work with outside of Chicago that would bring an NIV to church. And I'd swap it out and give them a King James and say... 
you have to have the word of God. And uh, I have a lot of regret uh, from people that I think I hindered in the past. And uh, that's that's the background. I won't go too much into what brought me out. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, but that's where I was. I, I believed it. Um, I thought I was trusting what God had said about his word. And I think I, I had a true love for God's word, but was unbalanced in that view of King James onlyism. Well, that's a very honest and fair assessment of your background. And again, still showing some, you know, some respect for people who I'm sure loved you and, and loved, oh, yeah. loved God, you know, just maybe are, are wrong in this area. And, and I want to be clear that even though uh, at times tonight I may say some things and we all may say some things that would, that would be in disagreement with the King James only movement, we're, we're not saying that these people are not saved, uh, or exactly. that they, you know, or that they are a cult or anything, even though I do think that there can be some cultish behavior in, oh, yeah. in Absolutely. some of the very, very strong King James only movement. Um, and, and, and we do see some, some, some very, uh, extravagant behaviors, uh, and, and, and what you just said, statements about things that are very, uh, hardcore. And, and so, you know, we want to be fair. We, we, this is a intramural debate. Um, even at least from our side, we would say Absolutely. this is an intramural debate. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, David, uh, you know, as I said, you're the, uh, you're the voice of the audio book. And, uh, just again, for the audience, if anyone is interested in getting this book, you can find this book on Amazon. It is called the forgotten preface by Joshua Barzon. You can get it in a, uh, 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 digital format, or you can also get it in an audiobook format, which David is the audiobook voice. And again, this is the third time we've been together, David. And uh, I want to thank you so much, uh, just n not only for being a voice in my head now, but also for being. Um, just being so uh, encouraging to me that you keep bringing people to me to interview. So I'm I'm thankful for for you. You you've been a big help to the show. Oh, thank you, thank you, Keith. Absolutely. So, if you would to tell me your whatever background you have with with this before the show, I don't, I don't, I don't want to take the words out of your mouth. Before the show, you said you really don't have a dog in the hunt in the sense that, it, but, 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 what's your background with this issue? Do you have a background with this issue at all? Um, I don't have a, a background with King James onlyism specifically. Um, mm -hmm. I have grown up with and used a New King James Bible. Uh, pretty much all my life uh, through several different churches and a couple different denominations. Um, I mentioned when we were talking before the show that uh, in, I've sometimes been in some other churches using uh, NIV or ESV where something will be read from the pulpit and uh, sometimes a pastor will comment, you know, this word might be better translated as, and I glance down at my New King James there and oh, look at that. That's the word that they use there. Um, so I, I've, I've been very happy with the New King James as a translation. It's very readable, um, and I I know from I know from recording Joshua's book book that the translation philosophy of it was to hew as closely as possible to uh, what the King James used whenever possible, although with updated um, language and idioms and and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I know Joshua is not advocating for New King James only either um but he mentions it as a as a positive uh a, a good modern translation that follows the same text sources that the king james did uh using modern language and yeah as it happens I, i've been very happy happy using it for pretty much all my life Absolutely, absolutely. And later on in the program, we are going to talk a little bit about the textual basis difference between the King James and the uh, more modern translations. I, our church, we are ESV only. People don't understand. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's a joke. That's a joke. We, we, no, but we, but we do use the. I, I preach from the ESV, and that's what's in the pews. Um, so I jokingly, anytime I meet a King James only, I'll say, "Well, we're ESV only," and I like to see their eyes just pop, you know, get, get real excited. <laughs> Well, I've been thinking about but, going uh, to the Passion Translation only myself. But. Oh, no. <laughs> I think I have to log off here. And see, yeah. Well, what's funny about it's funny you mentioned that, David, because the reality is, um, even though I would say I don't believe in King James onlyism, I do believe that there are some translations that are good and some translations that are bad. And you just happen yeah. to mention one of the bad ones. So, yeah. uh, so we want to be honest that, that there are definitely some that we would not recommend using. Right. <laughs> 
Yeah. So real quick, uh, Joshua, before we get into the meat and potatoes of the book, you mentioned earlier about the trash can analogy. And of course, you're referring to Codex Sinaiticus, which is uh, the story goes uh, in regard to Constantine uh, Van Tischendorf, who was uh, the one who discovered the manuscript uh, in the in the um, monastery there uh, that that he, prior to the discovery of the, of the manuscript, he had, he had seen some leaves that were in a trash can. And so the story goes that he found Sinaiticus in a trash can, but the actual reality was that it was in a, uh, a cloth inside of a, inside of a closet in one of the rooms of the monks. And, and there's a good, the, the story is actually in a book that I'm about to teach through, which is uh, Neil Lightfoot's book, uh, How We Got the Bible. If nobody's oh, ever yeah. read, if anybody's, yeah. Yeah, it has a whole chapter on Codex Sinaiticus. So, if anybody's interested in that story, but can you share with me some other things? Growing up in this situation, can you share with me some of the other arguments that you remember hearing and even using that endorsed the King James that that now you realize aren't good arguments? Um, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I'm. I gotta. I got my my stack of gotta pull up my stack of Bibles right here. Um, this is fruit for the my labor of all my study i've i told my wife i said hey if i'm doing this i'm allowed to get translations uh and use them and expense them for you know study material but i'll go to my my king james uh that i have here and i would say to start with the bible i think it'd be best to go to the textual the biblical reasons they would use to support king king james onlyism let me read you what i think would be the hallmark passage and i if you go to any uh, church that holds a King James only position. Um, I will, I'll buy you a coffee. If you can find their doctrinal statement that does not have Psalm 12 as a verse tag next to why they use the King James only. I have never seen anyone use or, or purport a King James only position without going to this passage. So let me read you the passage in question here. Um, and it says, or, you know what? I'm sorry. Psalm 12. I'm so used to my other translations. I, I got to find where I'm at now. <laughs> okay, here we go. Psalm 12. Okay, here we go. Psalm 12, uh, verse 6 in the King James reads this way. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And that is the the hallmark passage used to say, this passage is talking about the King James Version, that God would not just keep his thoughts, his idea, he would keep his words for all generations. So if we don't have every word of God, because we're told to live by every word, then we don't have the word of God. And then further, modern translations, compare it to the King James well, look at all that's missing from them. All that is omitted. This is the pure word of God that we have. And then to go even further to what I would say is a more extreme King James only position, they would take the part that says thou wilt preserve them um, or you'll, you'll try them as silver and purify them seven times. They'll take that to say the King James is the seventh edition of the Bible that God fully preserved and purified into its final state. And they'll take two different ways of saying you got Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Latin, early English, so forth. Basically, they, they start with the number seven being English and work down to make sure it adds up to that. And then they'll take the English translations of uh, Wycliffe, Tyndale, uh, Bishops, Coverdale, Geneva, you know, whatever it takes to get to the King James as the seventh. Um, there's many spectrums here. But nonetheless, I've never met a King James onlyist that does not use that passage to support King James onlyism. Wow. Okay. And was that one of the arguments that convinced you when you were in that position? Did you feel that that was a legitimate argument? Oh, absolutely. I would look at that and trust God at his word and say, I'm going to take this literally. If God's words are pure and God said he will keep them forever, then you know, I'm going to have faith. I'm going to trust that God is true. I'll say the linchpin of what broke me is when I read the context of Psalm 12. And the context of Psalm 12 actually shows what that passage is talking about. And it is not talking about God keeping his words. It's talking about God keeping the righteous and God protecting the oppressed. 
thou wilt keep them, the oppressed, from this generation forever, O Lord. And when you start reading through the first five verses of Psalm 12 and you see David crying out and say, God, you know, the godly man ceaseth, as the King James says, where are you? And God promises, I will protect you and I'll keep you forever. The funny thing that I tell people within King James onlyism is if you actually get a 1611 King James version of the Bible and you go to that passage in the marginal notes, you will see on the side that even the King James translators put in the side that the them is referring to the righteous and not to words as the object of preposition there. So um, I'm kind of going back and forth on my journey, but that was definitely something you asked about, you know, what was it like? What were some things we believed? Um, I think that's one of the key things we believed. And then I showed you that was one uh, linchpin that brought me out of that particular belief. That's that's awesome. That, that's a, and, and I, I'm, I, you answered my question really before I asked it because I was going to say, well, what what made you change and what made you change was context, right? Really Absolutely. understanding the passage. And I, and I want to say something just for because some people may just be listening to this uh, because some of you on our, in our audience, some of your audio, some of your video, some of you are watching the YouTube, some are listening through Spotify or Apple or whatever. Um, Joshua is like a really young man. If you can't see his face, he looks so young, but he's so intelligent. And 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 I appreciate it. How old are you? I hate to ask, but um, I'm getting old. I just turned 29. See, see, look at there. He's still in his 20s, and you're 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 a uh, very very intelligent young man. I'm, uh, again, the book was very well written, and uh, and uh, we're going to get into it here in a minute. Some of your arguments, but I, I appreciate you being uh, you know candid about how you grew up and the situation you grew up in. I want to ask you this before we get to the book, though. You, you mentioned your your father being very instrumental, in, and I know um, you know family can be a, a very difficult thing to have to sort of go against when you're when especially f when it's the context of faith if there's something that the family believes and you decide to believe something different I remember when I became a Calvinist my my my, my parents were not exactly thrilled uh, because they didn't know what that meant you know that yeah, to them yeah. that was weird yeah um, and it may be weird to you guys yeah I, I, I mean David knows me maybe <laughs> yeah. no, but um, I you. Obviously if you, ask, you can't, if you ask me my top five authors they're probably all gonna be Calvinist, so don't worry about me. <laughs> well, I was going to say the funny thing is you came on the show and you know the name of the show, so I guess. Oh, yeah. No, don't worry, <laughs> Yeah. What? Well, but but um, how how did the initial response of your family and have they have they moved now or are they still in the same position that they were in? And again, if that's too personal, please feel free to tell me. You know, rather not say, but not at all, because I'll give you kind of two sides to this. So my my parents are still very much so of the mindset of holding a King James only position. Um, I would say similar to you, this was a disappointment to them. And there was some strife and tension of trying to have these conversations, explaining why I have come to the position I have. And you can ask me later if you want of what brought me to that, the, the, the kind of events that led to that. That's an interesting providential way that God did it more than just reading a book. But um, it has allowed me and my parents to grow in love towards each other, understanding that the gospel is the core of what unites us and understanding that there will be differences as life goes on. And that love is not really true love until it's hard to do. Uh, it's easy, as Jesus says, to love those who love you. It's hard to love those that don't. And I'm not saying my parents don't love me. They do. They would give their shirt off their back for me, do anything. I love my parents. But this has been something that there has been some tension, but it has been an amazing, sanctifying grace of God. And I think showing us how to love the brethren, even with secondary differences that we might have. I'll pivot here and say this. My wife's family was another story. My wife grew up I would say even more hardcore King James only than even I did believing, you know, the purified seven times and all those things. And uh, her parents, when I started talking to them about this, my in-laws, they were skeptical. They were worried, but I, they let me explain these things to them. And they have actually left King James only ism and now read out of modern translations and are highly blessed and benefited from the privilege they have. And then, Kind of the, the third aspect I'll give here is not just my parents, but um, when I left King James Onlyism, I was on staff as an assistant 
um, at a Baptist church that held this position very highly. And when I brought this posi position to my then pastor, um, there were some long conversations because I held teaching and leadership roles at the church. I was essentially the youth pastor, the song leader, uh, children's ministry, etc. And he realized, if you do this, it'll be an affront to my position in the church's position. And I tried to bring a uh, compromise of, listen, while I'm at the church here, I will gladly use the King James for all pulpit preaching and teaching. But in my own discipleship with others and my children, my conscience basically constrains me to use vernacular, understandable translations with those that I teach the word of God. It came to a point that that was not accepted, and I was asked to leave my position at the church because of the position that I came to. That would, is what I would say was the most stressful, the most, I would say, strifeful situation that I had to come into and rely upon God's grace for a long season, even up until now, of dealing with relationships and, and approaching those topics. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I did want to mention too, David, you know, being as this is your third time on the show, you get to serve sort of a, as a co-host. So feel free if you have a question for Joshua or something you want to add, just uh, just jump right in because I definitely want to, I don't want to leave you out at all. Uh, I'm glad you. that you're here. I'm always glad to have you. Um, but Joshua, you mentioned about what the, before we get, again, I, I, I want to get to the book, I promise, but I'm so interested yeah, yeah. in you as a person. And, and I think knowing you as a person is going to help somebody understand the book. Cause I read the book without having really met you except for sure. through an email. And, and I feel like I learned a lot about you just reading the book. Um, sure. but now, now that I'm talking to you, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing things and I'm, I'm putting more pieces together. So what, what was it that, you know, what, what, what was the moment you said it wasn't really reading a book that changed your mind? What was the moment? Yeah. So I, I wish it was just, you know, reading James White's the King James only controversy and my eyes are open, but God did not have that in his plan. Um, <clears throat> it was two things. Um, I was working on at the time in my ministry at the church, on becoming ordained, getting ordained, and for that within my kind of denominational structure was putting together my statement of faith, uh, my doctrinal statement of faith, you know, all the, the ologies. And I came to them saying, I can't just repeat what I learned in college and copy and paste my systematic theology. There are some things I have questions about, and I need to ask God to open my eyes if I'm off on something, because I'm afraid of stamping this and being afraid of the fear of man for the rest of my life because I said X, Y, and Z at my ordination. So as I studied bibliology, I realized the bibliology I was given was just King James onlyism packaged as bibliology. And I began to look into the history of the English Bible and realizing the beautiful history of the Geneva Bible and uh, the Bishop's Bible and, and Wycliffe and, and Tyndale's translation work. And I realized, my goodness, God's word existed then and it even differed from the final version of the king james where was god's word before 1611 god either gave it in 1611 and was a liar before or god's not a liar and he's allowed this ambiguity within the realm of translation so i read all the books on one side i read d.a carson's you know a plea for realism uh <clears throat> james white's king james only controversy mark ward's book uh authorized um highly recommend that if uh, as a primer for this topic for people. And then on the other side, I read the King James only views of, uh, you know, people such as Thomas Strauss, uh, people such as, you know, even Sam Gipp and David Cloud and, and even Gail Ripplinger. And I just knew with her that she was a couple fries short of a happy meal. So I didn't read too much of that. Um, and, and I, I was so conflicted at seeing, you know, these, I, these views. I just had to zoom out so that everybody could see David and I laugh because that was a good. That was <laughs> sorry, good, sorry. It's, it's the truth. I said, I, it's a, <laughs> so, 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 uh, how, yeah. I have to stop you right there and just ask, uh, and I'm, uh, and you were going, so I'm, I'm, I apologize, but You're what good, no. what is the general cons what's the general consensus in King James only circles regarding Gail Ripplinger? Is it is it relatively? positive negative or is it mixed it's mixed the hardcore ones will love it and use new age bible versions as a textbook but i know many response more responsible king james only us that will even say no we know she's she's not right and even lies and i appreciate that about those that will at least um admit that about gail ripplinger have you ever do you know thomas ross um 
in a tertiary way, he actually graduated from the Bible college that I went to. Okay. Well, I recently interviewed him on the show, and he's he's going to come back on uh, eventually because we're going to come. He's going to come on and talk about landmark Baptist theology. Uh, oh boy! So looking yes. forward to that. I yeah. will listen to that. Um, but he, yeah, yeah. Well, he uh, um, in our interview. Uh, he mentioned that he, you know, he thought that Gail Ripplinger and even Sam Gipp were um, gifts to the other side, I think was the term he used. It, like they were like a gift to the non King James position because they made the King James position look so foolish. Yeah, yeah. I, I could see that. And, and I appreciate him at least admitting that and not, you know, trying to excuse their behavior. But, um, but no, yeah, so very, I, I felt like he was honest about that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I guess what I was saying and where that all connects to is, uh, you know, I'm reading all these books, and I'm so conflicted, and I'm like, God help me. And then I re- realized and remembered that I learned in Bible college, just as a passing note, a guest speaker had said one time that there's a, an interesting letter <clears throat> in the front of your Bible <clears throat> that you should read sometime that the King James translators wrote to you. And I don't think he was actually endorsing it. I think he was just being kind of hokey of like, you know, you should read your Bible from cover to cover, you know, even read the maps. And then he was like, you know, even at the beginning, if you had that letter, you should read it. <clears throat> and I opened up my King James Bible and it wasn't there. And, and I thought I was gypped. I want a refund on my Bible. Like, <laughs> why didn't they put this letter in, in my Bible? So that was kind of a spark that went off. And I went on Amazon and I bought this, um, a mass media print of the translators to the reader preface with updated spelling and an introduction by Edward J. Goodspeed from the early 20th century. I began to read this, and if I can show you as I flip through a little bit, I began to highlight and and notate and, and put all my notes in here as I read it. And I remember sitting on the couch reading this, and my wife walked by, and I looked at her, and I said, Honey, the King James translators weren't even King James only. <laughs> and it blew my mind realizing this and i would say you know i've been accused of josh is saying that this isn't the 67th book of the bible and he treats it as if it's inspired no that's the whole point is i so believe in the canon of scripture that i'm going to trust the philosophy of what these men graciously told us that we actually see materialize in their translation of what they've put in here as an introduction to it so that ended up becoming my book was my 10 theses on what they believed. And funny thing is, I I put these theses together to present to my former pastor and some people in my old ministries about why I believe this. They didn't want to read it, honestly. So I thought, well, I don't want to waste this. And uh, through some encouragement from others, I put it in a book format and it took off more than I ever thought uh, a random 10 thesis paper I wrote would ever do. Well, that's fantastic, and um, that that leads us right to where I wanted to go because I do want to I do want to get into sort of the meat and potatoes of the argument. And as you as you've already alluded to, they're really if you look at the contents page of the book, I've got it pulled up here on my screen. Um, it, it really is just four parts. Uh, the first part is what the King James translators believed, and that's your ten theses. Uh, and then there is an endorsement, uh, uh, and then there is the New King James Version defended. We're going to talk about that in a moment um, because you actually you are not you, you don't use the New King James Version, it, but you endorse it in the book. Correct. And we're going to talk about why that. Yeah, going to talk about why that is, um, and maybe even get into a little bit of textual conversation. Oh, yeah. Sounds uh, good to me. yeah, it sounds sounds like you've uh, sounds like you've dipped your toe into that <laughs> into that yeah. topic. I drank the uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so uh, so so Joshua, tell me why Westcott and Hort were devils. No, don't don't. Say that. <laughs> Well, they had six 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 tattooed on their upper forearm. If you ever see any old pictures of them, so yeah, well, but they were textual okay. critics, so they probably had six. They probably had six one six tattooed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gotta have the papyrus there. So, and David, what's I'm curious, even of you, you said you don't have a dog in the fight. Um, have you heard these different attacks and arguments against the critical text, or is this kind of foreign to you? Even I'm familiar with some of it. I'm sure I'm not as familiar with it as you are. Um, you're uh, blessed. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, no, I, I'm, I'm definitely familiar with some of it. I mean, I, I have uh, a reprint of, uh, I think it's uh, Bishop Burgeon's or Dean Burgeon's uh, yeah. book on uh, the the longer ending. And, you know, some, some of these discussions I, I have a little bit of familiarity with, but uh, I haven't studied them nearly as extensively as you have. Yeah, it's it's very niche, so I, I'm not surprised. Yeah, I, I actually and did we'll, have a question or, for you, Josh. If if that's okay, yeah, um, absolutely. You mentioned yep. about the um, about the the preface being dropped. Do you have any history on why that happened? Was that just sort of a cost cutting measure, or do you think there was some sort of was there anything nefarious there, or is it just a matter of convenience? That's a great question, and <clears throat> I, as much as I can piece together, um, having you know hoping all things and having charity as my driving principle. I don't think there is anything <clears throat> nefarious with it. Um, what I've traced with Bibles I've collected <clears throat> and that I've looked into with facsimiles and such <clears throat> is it seems right around the end of the uh, 19th century into the 20th century is when you start to see it dropped out. And I think it became with mass production, um, growing populations, um, you know, the boom of, you know, modern missions, you know, with D.L. Moody even and R.A. Torrey and their evangelistic meetings and you have more Bibles getting printed. I think it was a cost cutting measure. And I actually wonder if I could go back in time and have them put them in there, if maybe it would have neutralized King James onlyism in kind of a butterfly <laughs> effect way. So, um, yeah, I don't think it was anything nefarious, but I, I actually wondered that at first and uh, was you know, kind of disappointed to figure out like, no, people were just saving a couple bucks, I think, with printing. Kind of like a back to the future thing oh, uh, yeah. where, you know, if you could go back like Marty McFly and make it to where they were in there, maybe that would have changed everything and yeah. all the future would have been different. Yeah. This is totally off topic, but it's hilarious because I saw it today. <clears throat> I saw a, a meme of, of Donald Trump from like 1980 when he's young. And it says, why does, why do all these time travelers keep coming back and trying to kill me? I'm just a realtor. You know, and <laughs> I, I I saw that and then I thought about our interview and, and then David mentioned that question. And, you know, I can see these producers, you know, of Bibles in 1899 being like, why are you guys coming back and trying to put this preface in here? You know, and, you know, we hindsight's 2020. That's that's funny. That's funny. Uh, well, I have a question for you, David. David inspired me to a question because uh, not only was the preface a part of the original 1611, but um, the the apocrypha was also part of the uh, 1611. And we never ever hear. And I realize this argument is is yeah, I'm not making an argument. I'm just saying this is something we we don't we don't hear King James onlyists typically advocating for the inclusion of the apocryphal books, even though they were in the 1611. When you were a King James onlyist, how would you have responded to that if somebody said, "Hey, we should have these additional 12 books or 14 or however, however you count them"? Um, your your answer would have been, I would say, well, the one I have now doesn't have it in it. <clears throat> you know, I know that's kind of basic, but at the end of the day. You know, that's kind of what you have to go off of. And I think it connects to the point that nobody uses a 1611 King James translation anymore. Um, <clears throat> at the best, most people use a 1769 uh, Blaney revision of the King James translation that even updated uh, spelling and grammar. Um, and even to some degree, some word changes were made in 1769 versus the 1611 that most King James only don't know about. So I think that kind of erased the apocryphal tradition. But if I was pressed harder, I think I was asked that one time by someone. <clears throat> and I said, you know, the trans, you, you know, whoever put it together, my limited knowledge, they understood it was below scripture, which I even hold today, you know, at, you know, even if someone claims it should be in there, they understand it's deuterocanonical at best, um, historical, honestly, at, at, at the best practice. Okay, so you you would just argue it, it was never really the Bible, even though it was in the in the printing. Yeah, it was like you know they they put it in there, and then some you know conspiracy theorists I've heard say the Catholics were behind putting it in there, and then God purged it in 1769 and got it out of there. You know, as long as you end with the the what you're holding in your hand, anything you say justifies it at the end of the day. You know. <clears throat> Well, in fairness, if you and, look at um, a reprint of the 1611, you'll see where the Apocrypha is. They took pains to print Apocrypha on yeah. every page where that appears. Yeah, um, interesting. So that, you know, they're, they're make, they're make, at least, uh, I know it's on the first page. I believe it's on every page, though. The, 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 the publishers, the printers were... No, you're, were you're right. Really... I'm... I'm holding my 1611 up now, and <clears throat> uh, unlike the other parts of the Bible, it says Apocrypha on both pages, 
But when you go to the Bible, it doesn't say Bible, you know, on both pages. So I, I did not know that, David. That's very interesting. I'm, I'm going to tuck that away as a, as a little nugget in my mind. Is a little little red flag that th this isn't really scripture on yeah. on every page that it appears. Yeah, very yeah. interesting. Well, as we yeah, as we go back again to the book itself, your book, not the not the King James, <laughs> but <laughs> your book is based on ten theses uh, uh, that are related to the question of the the King James translators. Now, uh, for people again who are unfamiliar, the the King James Bible was was translated not by a single person. It wasn't translated by King James himself. I've, <laughs> I've heard some silly people who talk about the King ja the King as the translator. That's not the, yeah. th that that's a very ignorant the thought. Uh, <laughs> but but it was authorized, and therefore a lot of King James advocates will call it the authorized version because it was authorized by uh, the King. And your first thesis uh, says that the King James translators believed that any attempt to produce a modern translation of the Bible would be met with resistance and suspicion. So you're you're saying in here that even they were met with some of the same <laughs> critiques and and arguments that people today who are translating Bibles are met with that they are that they're nouveau that they're creating something that doesn't need to be done. So to speak to that for a minute, just this first thesis, because oftentimes we front load our most important point. That's the, and I'm not saying that is your most important point, but I'm sure you have thoughts about it. Sh share with us, you know, why you put that one as the as the first thing. Yeah, so I would say part of the reason <clears throat> I put that as the first thesis is that was chronologically one of their first points that they bring up in their preface. Um, <clears throat> these theses kind of came as I would write in the, the margins of my, you know, preface that I bought. <clears throat> and as I looked at this one, um, I realized, you know, as you said, they realized that any modern translation work would be met with resistance. And I'll read you a quote of theirs from the preface that is in my book. They said that new works, basically, we could substitute in, it, substitute in their modern Bible translations <clears throat> are welcomed with suspicion instead of love, with emulation instead of thanks, and if there can be any hole left for a petty objection to enter, a petty objection, if it does, will find a hole and make one. It is sure to be misconstrued and in danger of being condemned. This will easily be granted by as many as know story or have any experience. For was there ever anything projected that savored any way of newness or renewing, but the same endured many a storm of gainsaying and opposition? I just think it's hilarious that their point there could get applied to the the scorn that even modern translations have faced over the years in the same way that their translation was treated at the time that they produced their new translation in 1611. Yeah, and something to consider, and I'm just, just glancing down, in the third or fourth paragraph here, you say the translators clearly understood that their endeavor to make a new translation of the Bible, actually a revision of the Bishop's Bible of 1568, would cause that translation to be set upon a stage to be mocked and nitpicked and criticized by the religious crowd of their day. So, so, the, so the King James Bible itself is a revision of an earlier Bible? Absolutely. The King James is a revision of, <clears throat> of the Bishop's Bible. Um, in fact, if we want to be honest, the King James is just Tyndale 2.0. Um, <clears throat> it, the King James, I forget the percentage, but I think it's over 80% of the exact wording that Tyndale had in his New Testament is verbatim in the King James translation. Um, <clears throat> granted, 15%, there's a lot of leeway of changes and such, um, but we have here a beautiful English history of translation just being continued and passed on with a torch with the King James Version. Yeah. And uh, very quickly, just just as I said, I'm, I'm looking through as we're talking here, the second thesis, uh, not to jump ahead too fast, but it says, the King James translators believe that the Bible should be available in the common English of the then present age. Now, I, I have heard, and I want you to, to, to speak to this for a moment, I have heard the argument that the King James English was never the common English, that it was always a special type of English speaking. Uh, David didn't like that argument, I don't think. He may... <laughs> I'm sorry, looking at you, brother. Uh, but, 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 but to speak to that for a moment, is the King James in the vernacular of the day, or is, is uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so 
let me start off and, and read you a quote from the preface. And again, <clears throat> we have to understand these things reading the primary sources, um, which any historian does when they're going to say, this is what you know the Roman Empire did. Well, where are your sources? What, what makes you say that? <clears throat> so for someone to say, well, the King James was in a different holy language of the day. What are your sources? I've yet to see any. Now, here's my claim. Here's my thesis. <clears throat> the translators wanted the Bible to be in the common language so that the average man could understand it. Here are my two uh, supports for that. Number one, we have William Tyndale much earlier than then, but the King James translators carrying on his legacy. And Tyndale said he would he would make it that the plowboy in the field would be able to know more of the Bible than the bishop sitting in his room having dinner with him at that time because he so wanted people to have the Bible in his common language. We fast forward to the translators, and they say this in their preface. They say, but we desire that Scripture may speak like itself, as in the language of Canaan, that it may be understood by even the very vulgar. Two interesting things here. This opened my eyes when I realized they were saying the same way a Israelite at the bottom of Mount Sinai heard the Decalogue read aloud and understood it vernacularly. So, too, do we want the man of 1611 to hear God's word in that way and prophetically saying, and so, too, should the scripture always read that way? That would be my response to that claim. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and and, and honestly, it, 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 it does to us seem like a foreign and, and, and obscure and maybe somewhat of a lofty language because, again, we are 400 years removed from the time of the King James usage. So so yeah. to any one of us saying, yes, that this sounds like a special type of almost like a Holy Ghost language, well, yeah, it doesn't sound like the way we speak. And, uh, and, and I'll be honest, when it comes to just the grandeur of it, there are times where I prefer the way the King James says things, uh, just because it's the way I'm used to hearing them. Yeah. Uh, for instance, with the uh, the 23rd Psalm, I do funerals quite a bit. It's part of my ministry. I, I serve grieving families. And I I mean, every time, you know, I, I, I speak from the King James when I give the 23rd Psalm, because every other yeah. version of the 23rd Psalm with the exception of maybe the new King James, because I don't remember how it goes, but every other version, um, it sounds weird. You know, it doesn't sound like you think it should sound. If, yeah. if you grew up where I, you know, if you grew up yeah. in a situation where you, you were used to hearing it, or even John 3.16, um, to hear it in a way that doesn't use, you know, believeth in him yeah. or something like that. Or, or the Lord's Prayer, you know, something like that, that, you know, is so structured. And and let me say this as, as a point. I, I tell people all the time, I've been accused by some King James onlyists that know me of saying, you know, Josh, you just hate the King James. Why are you always trashing it? And again, I asked them, can you give me one soundbite of me ever saying anything negative? I actually feel like I have a greater appreciation for the King James now <clears throat> with my understanding of the preface and the history. And like you said, there's passages, you know, the majority of my memorization is still King James. I have to translate my memorized verses all the time. But I will say this, you know, my family passage, <clears throat> you know, we have it hanging on our wall and our kitchen is is in Deuteronomy uh, 6, you know, the Shema and, you know, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and thy soul and thy mind, thy strength, you know, and talk about it when you riseth and when you sitteth and when you walketh. And we say that together <laughs> as a family. I've got two daughters, <clears throat> a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and I want them to know that even in the King James because it connects to my history as well. I'm not ashamed of the King James and my history, but it's when it becomes an idol that I have a problem with it. And I think that's the balance we have to have is I still love and use and respect it. And I've even been at some places that use the King James and have asked me, hey, when you preach here or teach here, can you use it? And I say absolutely, because I appreciate the history that we have. And I think that goes along with your question of, you know, understanding the, the pros and the cons of, you know, even the understandability and, you know, how common it is with the average person. Yeah, yeah and I... I Go ahead. I think sometimes people confuse the high quality of the translation and the beauty of the King James, which is undeniably there, yeah. with thinking that it's so highfalutin that the 
common reader of the day wouldn't have understood it or listener of the day wouldn't have understood it. Something can be well-spoken and well-written and very clear and very beautiful, but also easily understood. And I yes. think that's what we have in, in the King James in the context in which it was written and translated. Um, my father was an English major in, in college and he still likes to use the King James and he talks about the, the, the just the beauty of it from just a, a stand, you know, lyrical standpoint and the way it flows and it's, it's, it's beautifully written. Absolutely. Uh, the, the problem is it's not in the vernacular today. Yeah. And I think it's interesting is where we have to go with this is <clears throat> there has been a, you know, regression and the average person's understanding of English over, I would say, <clears throat> you know, even the past 40 to 50 years. And again, that's me as not even 40 to 50 year old saying this, but I understand this from studying history and reading it. So I get the desire of people saying, you know, like, well, what are we going to have next? An emoji Bible? And, uh, you know, it actually does exist. It's it's interesting. I wouldn't preach out of it. But um, and I understand <laughs> <laughs> that that would be How funny. Could you? <laughs> I, exactly. <laughs> and I, I understand the, the zeal there and what they're thinking. But here's my thing is. So you're telling me that we're going to hurt the person that has been hurt by their education who's been hurt by their socioeconomical upbringing. And we're going to tell them, hey, I'm sorry, you know, you're a product of English, you know, regressing for 40 years. You know, this is on you now, rather than in love coming to them, bringing to them the word of God. Um, you know, they, we have the blessing of both functional um, and formal uh, translations. And I think that's a gift that the church has for both the scholars and for both the average person on the streets. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of, of of that, one of the things that you do also in the book, and I'm not I'm not going to give all ten of the uh, theses away because it is um, I want people to get the book. I don't, so yeah. I, so we're not going to read the whole thing to them, but uh, David will read the whole thing to you if you want to get a copy of it on Audible. Uh, he will be happy to have already read the entire book to you. But um, one of the things you do mention in the book is the the vast amount of words that are in the King James Bible that are no longer in use today, or more importantly, and I think you call them false friends. Is that am I am I remembering that correctly? The term Correct, absolutely. false friends. And yeah. what and what that is, if I remember from the book, is a false friend is a word you think you know the meaning of, but when you read it in the uh, the King James, they they have a different meaning than what you mean. Can you share some of those with our, our listeners so that they know what we mean when we say there are false friends in the King James? Absolutely. And I will first off give a credit here. Um, <clears throat> that phrase is not mine. Um, I have happily stolen that phrase from a good friend of mine, uh, Mark Ward, and that comes from his book, um, Authorized, uh, the Use and Misuse of the King James Version. Mark Ward has grown up <clears throat> in King James Oleism, or let me rephrase that. He's grown up around King James Oleism his whole life, but he's never really been directly affected by it. But now he's made a ministry out of helping bring people out of it. I would highly recommend that anyone checks out his channel on YouTube. And he has a series called Words You Don't Know That You Don't Know. I think he's on like Word 50 right now, and he does a whole video on them. Um, <clears throat> but he, I'll read you some just from his book here that he has. Um one of the ones that got me was just a simple one, uh, was, uh, you know, something such as suffer. <clears throat> when Jesus would say, suffer the little children to come to me. And I have had someone hear that before and go, like, Jesus wants to hurt these little children. He wants them to suffer, you know, and, 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 and the word suffer, you know, in our language now means to allow. Jesus was saying, allow the little children to come to me. But in 1611, suffer meant to allow. Um, we understand that even as we look at history of, you know, suffrage, you know, suffrage acts. Um, we even, you know, in older writings, you can kind of pick up on it. Um, that's one example. Another one is in the Old Testament, there's a story of the prophet on the mountain. <clears throat> I think it's Elijah. And he tells, uh, you know what, I'm, I'm botching it. I, I think it might be Joshua. It's in the Old Testament. Okay. It's not in the Apocrypha. But somebody says, how long will you halt between two decisions? And the word halt in common English today <clears throat> means to stop, you know, halt there, stop. 
but the way it was used in 1611 and you know you go to the the hebrew word that doesn't change it actually means to to go back and forth to deliberate back and forth on a decision giving the idea of somebody halting on crutches they're they're hobbling they're going back and forth these are just two of many many false friends that have changed their meaning not because god has not kept his promise but because translations are the product of adapting with changing language over and over and over again so yeah plug for mark ward he's got a whole video series but those are two of many many dozens of false friends that are in the king james version um, but that concept of false friends i just want to mention is not exclusive to older english um i remember when i was learning french the word library means bookstore it doesn't mean library oh, but that, that's a false friend between french and english um, yeah and that's actually where i first heard the concept and and that really clicked with me when I was, when I was reading your book and you're talking about this idea of false friends within the English language. And that's, that's, that's the problem. It's another language. Yes, it's very, very yes. close to English, very close to modern English, but it's early modern English. It's not today's contemporary English. It's subtly, but surely in some respects, a different language. And that's the problem. Yeah. Wow. And that's interesting. Just even within languages today, like you're saying, I mean, I remember how disappointed I was when I realized that French fries weren't from France, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, the, these things carry over no matter what you're doing. And, and, uh, you know, I, I think even within my parents' generation, um, the word gay meant something different 60 years ago than it does today, you know, and, and, uh, you know, let's just even take the word bowels. Um, I love reading a translation where Paul does not say that his bowels yearn for the believers that he loves. You know, I mean, that evokes, you know, ideas of colitis and, and Crohn's in my mind now, you know, not not his love for them. And I get what they're getting at is, you know, the deepest part of you, you know, like in the Old Testament in the King James, David will say, I was pricked in my reins and in my kidneys. That Hebrew, um, you know, ideology of, of your kidney being punched, that feeling of, of pain. But the problem is, if the average person doesn't know what that's meaning, that actually is a piece of God's word that is lost to the average person that's reading it. And you hear uh, some King James advocates, and I'm sure you growing up around them, Joshua, you, you, you've heard this. But the King James, King James advocates would say, but these are God's words and therefore they are right. And the people should just, they, they should learn what they mean. And that, so they put the onus on the reader rather than on the translator. They say the translation is perfect. Therefore, the reader should simply uh, just just have a, have a dictionary in their hand, even though the dictionary is it's going to have to be a few hundred years old. Well, you, I'm not even being funny about this. Within King James Onlyism, we were told to have in our library a Webster's 1828 dictionary so that we would be able to find the words. And, you know, when Webster put that together, he used the Bible, you know, the King James at the time, as a basis for a lot of the explanations of the words and definitions. So you're at exactly on the money that you have to literally have a 200-year-old dictionary to even know what they mean. And I want my kids to be able to use an Oxford English dictionary from school and realize that their spelling test and the words in the Bible have the same meaning. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I want to move to the uh, to the second part of the book. As I said, I definitely want people to read it. I want people to go get their copy and listen or read however they choose to uh, however they choose to consume it. But in the second part of the book, which is a pretty large section, you spend time with your defense of the new King James translation. Now I will, I will go ahead and say that when I first heard it, I was a little concerned and, and, and this is just a honesty to, from one brother to another. I was thinking, well, uh, perhaps he is still, um, married to the TR, even though he has, uh, even though he has stepped away from the King James only movement, the, a lot of people don't realize this. And, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm saying this right. There there are two different types of King James only. There are those who hold to King James only, and that's it. But then there is a secondary, more subtle, and he, and I would say more. Um, well, I would, more scholarly version, which says sure. the TR is the is the 
perfect Greek text, and the King James is translated from the perfect Greek text. Therefore, we have a perfect English Bible because we have a perfect Greek manuscript, which is called the Textus Receptus. And we don't have time in the show to go through the history of the Textus Receptus, yeah. but it is a it is a um, it is a manuscript which is based upon a very limited amount of available manuscripts at the time. Uh, when I say limited, I don't mean to one or two, but it was less than as it was available today. And so uh, the those who hold to it say the, this this represents the true perfect Greek Word of God, and the English is based upon that. And so when I heard you um, defending the New King James, like I said, my thought was okay he's a TR guy, but then talking to you, you said that's not the case. So tell me, yeah. tell me where you land on that. Uh, if you don't mind gladly, and I'll keep it succinct because this could be a whole nother, you know, t- a topic on, you know, textual criticism. But, um, <clears throat> I would say I was kind of TR preferred, not even only, but preferred at my first stages of coming out of King James only as <clears throat> And then upon further, study and research, I understood even that was, I think, a wobbly position. And the reason why is there is no Textus Receptus. There's the Textus Recepti. There are multiple Textus Receptuses. I mean, what Mm -hmm. are we talking about? Are we talking about Erasmus' first edition or his fourth edition? Are we talking about Beza's TR? Are we talking about Stephanus' TR? Um, Or or as King James only us don't realize, the TR they're referring to, if they give you a volume, a book of a TR, it's Scrivener's back translation from the 1881 revised version <clears throat> where he just went through and took every choice the King James translators made, put it in the Greek, <clears throat> and presented that as the Textus Receptus. So I think we have to realize that there is no single Textus Receptus. There are Textus Recepti, multiples of them that even differ with each other. Um, if you're listening to this and you are in King James onlyism and, and this has got your mind going, you're thinking, um, email me, contact me. I will give you a list that I have put together of variations between Texas receptuses and where the King James actually chooses different TRs for different situations. And you can see textual criticism in the King James translation as they were looking at different manuscripts and putting it together. So Keith, I would say that is what kind of broke my very short stint vacation in the land of TR onlyism. And, and and what you just said is very important. I hope people I hope people watch this entire show because you know what you just said was worth the whole hour to me. That 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 just letting people understand when they say we are TR only TR only advocates. There's no such thing any more no. than there's one King James because yes. the King James was translated in 1611. The second edition had over 400 ed- edits from the first. So which yeah, one yeah. is correct? And then exactly. like you said the 1769 Blaney revision is different than the others and we say different what do we mean? Well well it has changes. If the if the word of God is pure based upon the psalm you mentioned earlier and it's you tried seven times and purified then why does it need an addition and why does it need a revision and why is the Blaney revision the perfect one but not the later revisions which were the based upon you know the Westcott and Horton these different things that happened later. Why are these things bad, but that was good? And of course, yeah. we know a lot of the arguments about Westcott and Hort are 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 uh, a lot of them tend to be ad hominem, based yeah. upon the the men themselves rather than the the arguments from the text. And I'll, I'll throw one thing out here, and and it's one of my points, one of my theses in in my book. <clears throat> the translator said, I'm paraphrasing here, not to judge the character of the men from the past that have done translation work for us. They even quote uh, Symmachus and uh, you know Theodosius and, and Aquila, who they literally in their preface say are heretics. <laughs> you know, uh, one of them they say, you know, was was a member of the Ebionites, uh, which, you know, fun thing for you if you talk to Brother Ross about landmarkism, um, you know, once you get into the Donatist and, and the, uh, the Ebionites, you know, in that North African region there, I mean, there's some weird doctrinal views of Christ, whether he was Jesus at the baptism or, or before kind of an ancient modalism. The reason I'm saying that is not a rabbit trail. I'm saying the translators of the King James understood that they were standing on the shoulders of even heretics or men that they may not enjoy heaven with in eternity, and yet God providentially used them. And I think that has to be used as well with our view of modern translations and those that have done the work into them. 
Absolutely. So even though you're not new King James only or TR only, you do make a good case for the, for the, for the value of the new King James version. Now, is that something that happened as a result of you coming out of this and trying to find a translation that you wanted to use? Or was that just your way of sort of trying to find a middle ground between yourself and those who hold to the King James only position? What was, what was your reasoning for really, cause you, again, you do a good job of defending the, the new King James position. What was, what was your, what was the motivation there? Yeah. Phenomenal question. I would say both of what you mentioned. Um, <clears throat> the new King James was my stepping stone out of new, out of King James only ism. It was for me to be able to hold on my hand and without really diving into the textual differences at the time, but understanding I needed to understand God's word vernacularly and use it with those I was discipling the new King James fit the bill. And for me, I was told all the time growing up and in Bible college that even the New King James and all these translations were all from the critical text. I remember a very well-known speaker in King James Onlyism, uh, David Sorensen. You'll, you'll never probably know of him, but people that are in it, they, you know who I'm talking about. He came to my college and he had two tables and one was a stack of all modern translations and the other one had the King James on it. And he said the difference between these two tables – is all of these, with all the translations, ESV, NIV, New King James Version, these are all from the critical text, the bad text. <clears throat> the King James is the only one today based on the TR. So when I realized, wait a second, there are TR-based modern translations, such as the New King James, um, the MEV, the Modern English Version, and even the Modernized Geneva Bible, I realized for those whose consciences are still bound by that view of, of manuscript differences, God has even blessed you with modern translations that your conscience will allow you to use. So that was the phase I was in when I wrote the book, but I, I, I wasn't very rock solid there, but I kept it in there when I published the book a while later because I realized I would be giving too much to swallow by handing, moving from King James onlyism and tackling textual criticism in one book. So I felt like the Lord led me to use the new King James as saying, Hey, will you at least take one step? And if you truly do believe, Hey, it's, it's a manuscript issue. If I can get you to at least come there, then can you please accept the new King James? And I have seen that open up people being able to talk about, okay, now I understand why it's okay to use the ESV or the CSB or etc. So it really is a stepping stone of me helping bring people out of King James only is and I've seen a lot of fruit from that, honestly. Well, I have a, that, that leads to another question. Uh, and that is the, one of the arguments that I heard from someone who was a King James advocate, who was arguing against the new King James is that, well, we don't allow the new King James because the new King James has textual marks that talk about the, uh, manuscript differences and the King James doesn't have that because it's the pure word of God. And I want to ask you just, just to tell the audience, did the original 1611 have marginal notes? Absolutely. And I'm looking for it. Here we go. <clears throat> if you don't believe me, um, you know, I I'll literally read you one. Here is Colossians uh, chapter three. I have it bookmarked here of my orange mark. I always go to this one. And uh, this is a verse many of us have memorized. Uh, here it is in the King James. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And then it says, Set your affection on things above, not on the earth. Most modern translations will translate affection as mind. Set your mind on things above. I have literally heard Sam Gipp and others attack that example and say, No, God doesn't care about your mind. That's that's where the intellect is, and that gets you in trouble. Your affections, that's your emotions, and that's what God wants. He doesn't want your intellect. He wants your affections. The problem is, in the 1611, in the footnote, it also has mind in the footnotes as what that word could be translated as. So I, I go back to this, and, and I say that's not just it. There are thousands of footnotes, and um, I have been asked to do it, and I'm trying to work on it. I'm hoping within the next year or so to put out a second book called The Forgotten Footnotes, going through these very forgotten footnotes in the King James Bible and showing the light that they also shed on this topic. 
Well, I tell you what, that would be excellent because uh, I, I would be curious uh, regarding um, not only translational footnotes, which is what you just mentioned, but also textual critical notes that mention yes. various readings because those are there as well, right? It is, and, and I don't have it bookmarked, but um, <clears throat> I might be able to find it. If I don't, I'll, I'll quit. But in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter <clears throat> 22 or 21, it's the passage where it says, you know, one will be taken, one will be left in the field, one will be grinding, one will not. Um, yeah, okay, so I, <clears throat> I think I'm, I'm here at it. And it says right next to there in the marginal notes, most ancient manuscripts do not contain this wording here in that passage or this verse. Um, there's another one I'm looking at here. It caught my attention too. Um, oh, and now, 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 wait a minute. What you just said was in the was in the 1611. Yes. So I'll show you right here. I'll read the verse. <clears throat> if you don't believe me, go in your King James Bible to Luke chapter. I got to read the Roman numerals X V I I. Oh, 27. Okay. Sorry. I'm not good with my Latin. Uh, go to Luke 27 verse 36. And it says, two men shall be in the field, and one shall be taken, the other left. There are two lines next to that verse. Once you go to the margin, and I'll show you here, so if you're watching, you can see it. It says right there, I'm trying to get even, even. It says, this verse is wanting or lacking in most Greek copies. So you have right there huh. textual criticism in the margins of them alerting you, hey, this might not actually be Bible. This might have been added in later by a scribe to kind of balance off. Two women were doing this, and two men are doing this. Um, so if you're gonna if you're gonna say don't use the New King James because of the footnotes that reference the 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 modern translation, the NA, um, then have equal scales and don't use the King James either. Or if that's really a problem, then you are able to buy a New King James that doesn't have footnotes in it. There's lots of different versions. Uh, you know, formats out there. So that, that's kind of a, a straw man, I think is an argument. Wow. And that, and honestly, as I said, I, I really hope people listen all the way to the end because you were, you were, you were dropping some nuggets of gold because this is, I mean, this is again, somebody who is caught up in this, somebody who maybe hasn't thought these things through or is sitting under the burden of yes. the, the, the cultish mindset that, that is often behind some of the King James only movement. And again, not all, not all yeah. there, 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 there are those who, who, who are not that way, but the, among those who are, you are, you are providing some very, very helpful information. What you just showed, even on the screen, again, if you're listening to this, uh, 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 person who's listening to the show, go and watch it. He showed it on the screen. I hope it comes through very clearly because that's something you think you would see in a modern Translation. Yeah. I mean, when you when I'm reading my ESV and it says the 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 older manuscripts or the majority of the manuscripts don't include this passage, you think that's a new thing. That's 400 years old. It's been around, you know, since the uh, since the beginning of English translations. Exactly. So that's amazing. Thank yeah. you. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. And, and I'll yeah. say this too, Keith. Of um, the reason I speak so passionately about this is not just because I'm a nerd and and I love. Bible translations. I mean, I do. Trust me. I am. My wife has capped me on the Bibles I can buy for the rest of the year and theological books. I've, I've hit my expense already, but it's more than that. And it's my love for those who have been where I am. Um, just like Paul had a heart for the Jews because that's where he had come from. I have a heart for my King James only brothers. And I'll be honest with you, Keith, I, I will give King James only a, I will give you, I will concede to you one problem that you do have with those of us that use modern translations. Sometimes we are very condescending towards you. Sometimes we do speak down to you. Sometimes we, we are sarcastic. Now, let me just say this. You are towards us as well. So I think it's just kind of that, you know, give and take that we give. It's part of life. We got to have thick skin. But I will be honest that I think there are some very derogatory remarks that they've heard without the truth being presented in a way they can handle. And I look at my ministry, this little ministry I have, of being kind of the the fist down kind of a person as I approach this. And, you know, praise the Lord that we have people like James White who, you know, I'd be scared to debate him over whether my name is Josh or not, okay? Like he would beat me and tell me <laughs> my name is not Josh, okay? Um, I That is very needed, and we need people like that in the church. But I think we also need people that are willing to say, hey, we'll let the big dogs do the big stuff. Let me just be a friend that will that will – answer all your emails of you 
coming up with the craziest questions, but I'll answer them kindly and succinctly and keep talking to you. And, and I've seen that be a very fruitful ministry of mine, even over the past year. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, as we have to, and I hate to, but as we've gone over an hour now, we're going to have to start drawing to a close. But I do want to ask uh, before before I begin to do that, David, do you have any other questions for Josh that you want to bring out or maybe something from the book that you'd like to uh, to get people to think about as we begin to think about how we are going to bring this, uh, bring this plane into the hangar? Not particularly, no. I, I, I really appreciate uh, I, I just re-listened to it today since it's it's a short listen, and that makes it relatively cheap on Audible, folks. Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, I just re-listened to it today because um, I wanted to refresh the you know the, the topic in my mind. I, I think Josh did a great job of really hammering the key points. Uh, there's there, there's no fluff in there. You know, the, everything that's that's is there is there for a reason, and I really I I appreciate having been associated with it. So thank you, Josh, for the opportunity to read it. Oh, amen. Thank you, David. And and I appreciate you taking on the endeavor. Um, David helped me out financially with it from what he normally charges for <clears throat> audiobooks. And and me just being an independent guy trying to reach, you know, my brothers, um, I couldn't have done this without David. So, uh, David, greatly appreciate you pairing with me and, and helping in this endeavor. And please, David, uh, I know it says davidkmartin.net, but, but just for a minute, uh, use, use the platform to tell everybody what you do, how to get a hold of you, things like that. If, they, if they're interested, you know, just give, a, g- give yourself your own little commercial here for a second. Tell, tell everybody, anybody interested in what you do, uh, what they need to do. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, my, my website is davidkmartin.net, not .com, .net. Um, and... Uh, you can hear some uh, just some general samples of a few books that I've put on there. I think right now I might have a link to uh, a YouTube clip of another book that I've recorded. I do also have uh, a YouTube channel, which just consists of excerpts from some different books that I've, uh, that I've recorded. And I believe there's a link with pretty much all my social media links, I think are at the bottom of my website, davidkmartin.net. Um, and you can also contact me by email there. If you have a, book that you'd like recorded, especially if it's a Christian topic, especially something related to Reformed theology or something along those lines. That's Those are my favorites, really. Uh, so I'd be uh, very interested in talking with you. Thank you. Absolutely. And again, thank you for continuing to bring me great guests and good books. And uh, yeah, you've been responsible for for <laughs> for a lot of my consumption recently. And uh, like I said, I, I'm now hearing my thoughts and your voice. So... <laughs> That's scary. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Josh, as we begin to, to draw to a close, I want to ask you just, just this one simple question. Uh, You know, if, if, if you, if you had the opportunity to speak to somebody who was in the same situation that you were in, and I know there's so many things that we could talk about. We could talk about textual criticism. We could talk about James White. I'm sure he is not very popular in King James only circles. Um, You know, we, we could talk about things like the comma Johannium and the longer ending of Mark. And there's a lot of conversations that could be had there. But if you could, if you could say something to someone who's listening, who maybe is still in the King James only camp, maybe in one of these cultish groups who feels somewhat like, like, like they would be abandoning the word of God if they went and, and, and were to pick up a, a new King James Bible or, or even a ESV or something, what, what would be your, your initial outreach to them and, and your word to them? And we'll, we'll let that be how we draw to a, to a close. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful way to end this. <clears throat> I would first of all tell you, that person, when you're looking at this issue, if you're listening, that means you definitely have some questions. Ask yourself, is my fear of changing on this the fear of God, or is it the fear of man? They can be very closely related sometimes. We have authorities in our life. We have pastors. We have spiritual mentors. But you need to ask yourself, at the end of the day, do I fear God or do I fear man? And if you keep thinking, well, what will they think about me? And what will this person say? Then your fear is the fear of man. It's not the fear of God. If your fear is the fear of God, and like, man, I don't want to corrupt his word. I don't want to not have it. Then my question to you is this. If you truly believe that you hold every single word of God, not just the ideas, every word in the exact order in your hand right now from the King James, where was that copy in 1610 that your brother in Christ 400 years ago could hold in their hand and say, God has given me every word? 
why has God given you a special revelation that you have every word in order that no one through history, according to your view, has ever had? The problem with King James Onlyism is it, at its root is it makes God a liar up until 400 years ago. Whether big or small, that's what it does. And I also implore you to consider this. Even though you might be able to understand it very well because you were raised on it maybe, how about the people you disciple? How about your children? How about those that are going to hear this preached and taught and, and they just have not been blessed to have the understanding that you do? The principle of love in the Bible commands us to think of others more than ourselves. And listen, if we're thinking of ourselves, then yeah, let's keep using it. It's tradition. We like tradition. We've always used it. We're familiar with it. But I look at Christ. I look at his character. I look at the Holy Week that we're in right now coming up to Calvary and his sacrifice for us. And what Christ did is he laid aside his royalty. He laid aside his comfort. He laid aside his splendor to become one of us, to go to the cross and to bear our guilt and our sin. I'm not trying to make a big stretch here and trying to allegorize this, but I believe even in this topic, we need to ask ourselves, what would the love of Christ constrain me to do? To stay comfortable and familiar with what I know or to out of love, make a decision that will help others love and know the word of God. And then with that, talk to people like me, talk to people like Mark Ward and others who have come out of King James onlyism, and we will tell you, we love the word of God. We would even say more than previously because we understand so much more of it because we understand all of it within our language. My my daughter now quotes Bible verses and, 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 and sings Bible songs. And there's a joy in my heart knowing my daughter knows what all of those words mean. And she can say that to her neighbor and her neighbor will understand all the words. And, and she can say it to someone that's illiterate and doesn't know English well, and they'll, know under, they'll understand what John 3.16 or this passage means, every word of it, not just some of it. So I close with saying that if you are considering this topic, realize that we are doing this because we love God, we love his word, and we love his people, not because we're trying to corrupt it. Please understand that is our heart and why we approach this issue the way that we do. Amen. That is a, a wonderful appeal. And I want to thank you again, Joshua, for putting together a great book. And people can find that book again on Amazon. The title of the book is The Forgotten Preface, Surprising Insights on the Translation Philosophy of the King James Translators. And uh, I want to mention also, I'm going to be using this. I'm going to be teaching a course, and it is on how we got the Bible. It's a survey of how we got the Bible. And I'm going to be using this podcast as one of the required things that our students have to listen to oh, nice. as they go through the translation of the English Bible. So you have contributed not only to your book, Book, but you and David are also contributing to our class. And if anyone's interested in being a part of that class, we do make that class available for free online. And anyone who would like may go to SovereignGraceAcademy.org and you can create a username and uh, create your own account there and you can sign in and be part of our class. It begins on April the 16th. So again, thank you men both for being with us today and contributing to the education of our listeners and uh, to the body of Christ. Love you both. Thank you. Amen. Thank, thank you. you. And again, I want to thank you all for being with us today on Conversations with a Calvinist. And I want to remind you that uh, if you're listening to this or you're watching this on uh, it, whatever channel you are, please take a moment and subscribe, whether it's to the podcast or to the YouTube channel. Subscribing does help us. It helps us to reach a wider audience. If you want to support the show, the first way to do it is to subscribe and to like the content. Uh, another way that you can support, though, is through the Buy Me a Coffee ministry. You've seen that come up a few times on the video today. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash your Calvinist. You can make a financial contribution. Uh, or if you want to follow me on Twitter, ask questions or do anything like that, you can go to your Calvinist on Twitter. I've been wearing my shirt that my wife got me that has my Twitter name on it so that people can see that. And uh, also want to remind you that if you do have a question that you'd like me to address on a future show, you can send me an email at calvinistpodcast at gmail.com. I want to thank you again for listening to Conversation with a Calvinist. My name is Keith Foskey, and I've been your Calvinist. May God bless you.